something that you probably know about me by now is that I love military history, uh, any kind of history really. Uh, and one of the things that I enjoy looking at are basically failed like strategies, failed weapons of war, kind of kind of funny things that have happened throughout history. And one of the failed weapons that was invented during World War II is the Kumlauf. My favorite part of this is the way the guy looks, like really? <laughs> like we're supposed to use this? The, this is a gun with a bent barrel. A gun with a bent barrel, right? With a periscope on it so you can shoot around corners. Interestingly enough, it actually works. It just is not cost-effective to produce, and so they wound up not using it in, in Germany or in Japan. But it existed, and it still exists, exists. Um, stair, awkward stairs and all. So there are a lot of things in our lives that we go to to deal with the struggles of our lives, right? We turn to all sorts of things, and we want things that are going to endure, that are going to last, that are going to work. And I think when you come in here, my hope is when you come up in here on Sunday mornings, is you're hoping to have your faith strengthened, you're hoping to have it encouraged, you're hoping to have it built up, so that when you go into your Monday, you can then trust in the Lord, you can have a reliable faith, you can have a fighting faith, and you can go and, and, and take on the week, Right? I think it's okay to, to desire those things. But so often, the first encounter we have on Monday morning, whether it's, it's angry ki- children or tough sprout spouse or difficult roommate or a hard job or whatever it is, that faith seems to just melt. It's almost like that gun with a bent barrel where you're like, man, in, in, in the lab, in the safe, controlled environment, it sounds really good and it works. And then when I actually get it out in combat, when I field test it, it doesn't work anymore. We're talking about the life of David. And David had a fighting faith. And we're talking about this through the lens of power. Our faith and having a faith that fights gives us power. It gives us strength. So I want us to talk about how we can develop a fighting faith. We're in 1 Samuel 17. Very famous story. Everybody knows it. Even if you're not a churchgoer, you know it. It's David and Goliath. And I want us to look at this as basically three motivations that we have to, for a fighting faith. And then from there, look at some application that we have. But the fighting faith that, that I want us to talk about, you, when you talk about fighting, maybe that's the, the best way to talk about this. When you talk about fighting, you fight for certain goals and certain motivations. There's certain things that motivate us to fight, right? Reward, like is it worth it? Am I gonna, is my name going to be made great out of it? Like am I standing up for my reputation? and then fighting for other people, right? Those are motivations to fight. And you'll see these motivations in our story today. But I want us to look at how having a fighting faith takes those same motivations and almost sanctifies them and guides them Godward. So first, faith fights for fortune. For, faith fights for fortune or for riches. Let's look at verse 19 of chapter 17. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. Jesse's his dad. And he's going and bringing uh, bread and nutrients to his, um, to his brothers who are fighting with, with the army. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. What did Goliath say? Well, first, Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. He's a big guy, but taken number one in any NBA draft ever, right? Big guy. Lots of armor, big weapons, meant for intimidation, and he is a professional fighter. He's a professional champion. This is what he does for a living. He goes into one-on-one combat, he kills champions, and he moves on, right? And he goes out every day for 40 days and taunts Israel. You guys stink, you can't beat me, your God is worthless, on and on and on and on and on for 40 days, psychological warfare. And David hears all this, and he has one question. Let's look at verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Again, nine foot nine. How do you miss him? Have you seen this man? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. 
And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. That basically means tax exempt for the rest of forever. Uh, They are tax exempt, which some of you might be willing to fight some giants to be tax exempt. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. David has one question. What do I get if I go down in that valley and whack that fool? What do I get if I put that guy in the ground? And you might be sitting there and be like, well, David is supposed to be a really like, faithful person and really self-sacrificing, except for that whole Bathsheba incident. Why is he asking about reward? That seems really mercenary, really self-centered, right? Well, actually, if you fight for Israel in that day and age because of Israel's relationship with God, then you are fighting for God. And so when Goliath defies the armies of Israel, he's actually defying God. And that's why David's so worked up. And so David knows that when you serve the Lord, when you follow him in faith, God rewards his people. And so David's essentially asking like, hmm, I wonder what God's going to do for the guy that takes care of this. Now, he's obviously going to do it through King Saul. He's going to get to marry a princess. Basically, it's a Disney movie. But David wants to know about the riches that come from serving the Lord. And it's not bad to be motivated by reward. We don't talk a lot about reward in church because we feel like it makes us mercenary. But think about your life. Everybody wonders, what am I going to get out of this? Right? I mean, that's basically the number one impetus to getting into a fight or getting into a challenge, taking on something. What am I going to get out of this? Some of you are going to leave church today and be like, man, I didn't really get anything out of the service today. You got the Lord's Supper for one, and that is excellent, by the way. That might be all you need. But yes, We are self-interested people, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Self-preservation, desire of reward, actually helps me. I don't touch hot things on the stove. Why? It's going to hurt me. There's no reward in that. And plus, my wife does most of the cooking, so I don't have to. I don't touch that stuff. Reward. We're motivated by reward, and that's not a bad thing. The problem is when we take that motivation and sin comes in and twists it, turns us into greedy, self-centered, self-focused people. Then what happens is we apply that same kind of self-preservation and we apply it to everything else. We're all about getting what's ours, getting what's ours, getting what's ours. But there is reward, and being motivated by reward is not a bad thing. Did you know Jesus was motivated by reward? Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That joy is the reward that the Father had promised him. For the joy set before him. And in Hebrews 11, which is the hall of faith, right before Hebrews 12, that makes sense. David is mentioned in this hall of faith, great Old Testament heroes who are full of faith. And he's described as one who conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, and escaped the edge of the sword. Jesus has secured riches and reward for us through his victory on the cross. So when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus, we are trusting that there also comes with that reward, reward that's been promised to him. Now, what kind of reward can we expect? Well, there's a lot. But by trusting in Christ and following him, these are some of the things. One, an eternity of increasing satisfaction and joy in Christ. Imagine being with someone or doing something that never gets bored, never gets old, never gets tired, and is constantly something you can explore deeper and deeper and deeper. That is what eternity will be like with God. I know some of us are worried that heaven's going to be this one long giant worship service. It's okay. You can admit that. It's fine. What are we going to do? We're just going to stand there the whole time? One, no. But we're going to have satisfaction in Christ, and that's what's going to matter. That's what's going to matter. Two, right? You've got a place with him. I don't know about you, but it's nice to have a place in the world. It's nice to have a place, and especially nice when someone really important has a place for you. And Jesus has one for us. And then there's a crown of life. A crown is something of royalty, something amazing, something powerful, and life, vivacious, vigor. That's what the rewards are promised to us. So when you're faced with challenges, A fighting faith is going to remember there's something better that comes after this. I don't have to give in to this temptation. I don't have to give in to this anxiety. I don't have to give in to this worry because there's something better. Jesus is better than this. The reward that he'll bring me is better 
than this. Not to say you'll lose your reward if you give in to those things. What I'm saying is one of the things that can motivate you to have faith in those times is to remember what God has promised us, and it allows us to be faithful to him. So we're motivated by uh, fortune. We're also motivated by fame. Faith fights for fame. So we're going to skip some, some sections, basically a couple conversations David has. And then in 41, it says, And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The reason why Goliath is disdaining David is because Goliath has made his reputation on killing other champions. This isn't going to benefit David's or or Goliath's reputation at all. Because if he wins, all of his buddies are going to be like, man, you should have won that. But if he loses, it's like, oh man, you lost to like a 15-year-old kid. Way to go, Goliath. I'm just going to call you go from now on because you went away, right? Sorry, it was bad. I didn't use that one in the sanctuary, so. So he's, he's, and then in verse 43, it says, And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now, this is where Goliath really messes up. Because Genesis 12, 3 says, uh, God says to Abraham, If you, if anybody curses you, I'm going to curse them. Well, guess what? Goliath done messed up. Like, this is, this is probably the worst thing he does. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, now this is some great A trash talk right here, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So my weapons are better than your weapons. Oh, and by the way, you're outnumbered because there's me and Yahweh. Verse 46, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the bodies not just of you, like you said to me, but of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all the, this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with a sword, not with a spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. David goes into that valley fighting for the glory of one person and it is God himself. He's not going down there to make his name. He's not going down there to make his name like Goliath is doing. That's what Goliath is interested in. David has been seized by a great affection for God. And it motivates him to have a fighting faith, a faith that endures the taunts and the challenges and the fear. And often when I go into a fight, you know what I want to do? I want to make my name great. When I go into difficulties and challenges, when I have a hard day, I want to make my name great. So when I come home, I've noticed this about myself. Uh, The more I tell a story, and it's a good story about me, the bigger my role gets and the smaller everybody else's role gets, to the point where they eventually just fall out of the story altogether, right? It's like a fish story that your grandfather would tell, but I'm the fish, and I just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you probably do this too. You don't realize it, maybe, but you do it. We're very self-centered in the way that we talk about ourselves. We're all about our central importance in the story and the narrative, right? And society builds this into you, right? Follow your dreams. Believe in yourself. Just believe, whatever that means. You do you, you be you. Look, as we go through life, we want to build a name for ourselves. And once we build that name, then we become really scared that somebody's, somebody or something is going to come and take it away. Some of us in this room are struggling with something difficult. Maybe it's a secret sin that you have, something that you don't want anybody to know. Something that you think is dirty and gross and you don't want anybody to know about it. And the only way you're ever going to tell anybody about it is if you get caught. Because right now it's not doing anything to you. But it might also just be something you might think it's not doing anything to you. It actually is. On the other hand, you might think there's something innocuous. I've never had somebody come into my office and tell me, man, Travis, I'm really struggling with pride. We kind of sweep pride under the rug, right? We're like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. It's a huge deal. It's the thing that keeps us from actually humbling ourselves and following God. It's pride, arrogance. And until those things actually threaten our lives, threaten our names, threaten our stability, we don't deal with them. We don't address them. We sweep them under the rug. And you know what happens when you look at life through the lens of fighting to make a name for yourself? You know what happens to your perception of the world? Everything's a fight. And you become Goliath. Either people are there to help you make a name for yourself, like the Philistine army who are there to clean up after you're done, or you look at people as opponents to beat and batter into submission. 
And that line between the two gets real thin. Real thin. And this is the part where you want me to tell you how to be better. This is the part where you're like, Travis, I totally see that in my life. How do I, how do I fix this? I can't be more clear about this. If you go into that valley and you take on that fear, that anxiety, that temptation, that sin, whatever it is that you got, whatever baggage you have, if you go in there and you fight that thing by yourself, you are going to get scalped every time. Every time. Because you're going in there armed with faith, maybe, but maybe it's faith in faith itself, which is just going in unarmed. Maybe it's faith in like yourself. Well, that's going in with faith in the weapons of the world. That's going in faith with sword and shield that Goliath has. If David goes in armed with those things, he loses that battle because his advantage is in his size and his speed and the range that he's able to hit Goliath with. You know what David goes into battle with? He absolutely goes into battle with his faith. That is key. But David's not dumb. He's a brilliant tactician. And he actually goes in armed with two things. A stick of wood. It's a staff. He takes a staff into battle. And he takes five stones. Goliath is over here armed to the teeth with bronze and iron, weapons forged by man. David is over here carrying a stick of wood and, a, and five stones, both things made by God that you can find in nature. And God makes a name of himself for himself using a stick of wood and a stone. And guess what? Hundreds of years later, almost in the same place, God makes an even greater name for himself through Jesus Christ using a stick of wood and a stone. Same story. The stick's just bigger, it's the cross, and the stone's bigger, but it's a rolled away stone and it's an empty tomb. Same weapons, same fight. And what you have to do if you want to beat these things in your life, if you, you have to go to the cross. You have to use the weapons that God has given his people. If you don't go and armor up in, cro in the cross and the empty tomb, if you don't trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you've already lost. You can go to all the counseling and the therapy that you want. And those things are good things. But that should not be your first stop. Same weapons, same fight. They were good enough for David. They were certainly good enough for Jesus. Why do we think they're not good enough for us? Why do we insist on swords and shields? This makes God's name great. And when you have victory over those things in your life, your anxieties, your fears, your worries, and you're able to go and tell people like, yeah, I used to struggle with this, but I don't anymore because God's delivered me from them. It makes God's name great. When we have a fighting faith, when we use our faith and use the weapons that God has given us, the cross and an empty tomb, it makes his name great. And that's how we have victory. So we fight for his fame. We fight for his fame and we fight for fortune. But faith also fights for followers. Faith also fights for followers. Look at verse 48. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, near to meet David, David ran quickly. Notice the, the, the comparison. David goes quickly, Goliath moves slowly, ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone would have been about the size of a tennis ball, which, ow. The stone sank into his forehead, which means it broke his cranium and then sunk into his brain, and he fell on his face to the ground. And so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and he struck the Philistine and he killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. And then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharim as far as Gath and Ekron. That's about 10 miles. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. David runs over, cuts off the head of the Philistine, strips him of his armor. Now, why does he do this? Is he just being a jerk to Goliath? And no, not just being a jerk to Goliath. He's actually showing that Goliath is dead. Because remember, there's two armies on hills on the other side of the valley. It can be hard to see what's going on. But somebody standing there holding a decapitated head is pretty clear, right? People would have seen that. And it has two effects. One effect on the Philistines scares them to death and they go running. Israelites see what God does through David and they say, you know what? If God can do that through him, what can God do through me? And they take off. And they chase them down, they beat their enemies, and then they come back and they do something really cool. They pillage the camp. They pillage the camp of the Philistines, which means they took all their stuff, right? That's what they did. 
which is fantastic victory. That's, that's the spoils of war. That's what you get. In our day, in our time, our enemies, sin, death, evil, Jesus Christ has won that victory through the cross and with an empty tomb. Goliath has been decapitated. In our case, the serpent's head has been crushed. That's the Genesis 3 prophecy. It's been fulfilled in Christ. And so now we, like the Israelites, look down and realize, oh my gosh, there's, there's nothing now to be afraid of. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing standing in our way because Christ has the victory. And so what do we do? We respond the same way the, the Israelites did. You pillage the camp. You pillage the camp. So the, the enemy is now defenseless. He's been stripped of his weapons by Christ. So pillage the camp. Go and, and, and proclaim victory in your life. Again, I don't, I don't want to discount the role of, of counseling and therapy and prayer and, and long suffering. Like, believe me, those are, those are good things. But there comes a point where you have to recognize that your enemies have been defeated in Christ and you can trust him. You have to go to him in prayer. I imagine also that within that Philistine camp, because they had been fighting for so long, there were captive Israelites in there that were slaves to the Philistines. And when that army rolls into town, rolls into the camp, and it's like, hey guys, we won. You guys are free. Go home. There are people that you know that are still enslaved to their sins, still enslaved to their brokenness, still enslaved, and you know that the victory's been won. Go in there and pillage the camp. Take back those people. Let Christ through you Proclaim the gospel to them and let them know that the victory's been won. The war's over. And set them free. Pillage the camp. Let's pillage the camp together. Because David is fighting for the followers. And the faithfulness of Christ reminds us that there are other people, other believers and non-believers who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So I hope, and when I sat down and started working on this, I want this to be a Christocentric message. Because too often we hear the, the like, God can help you fight your giants. And there's, there's truth there. But it only helps us fight our giants through the cross of Christ. That's the only way it works. It's not anything else. But I don't want to leave you with just this kind of esoteric, sort of, okay, I just need to trust Jesus more. You do need to trust Jesus more. And deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. But I also want to give you things that you can do. I want to give you a plan. So we need to stick with the plan. Because what's going to happen is you're going to hit your Monday morning and you're going to be like, yeah, faith. Okay, cool. Like fighting faith. I'm going to trust in Jesus today. And you're going to run into the first thing that you encounter. You're going to be like, oh man, this is difficult. Like imagine if David was like, okay, I've got a plan. I'm going to sling some stones. I'm going to stay out of his reach. And I'm going to win this battle. But then when he gets close to Goliath, he sees that he's nine foot nine. He's like, I don't know about my plan anymore. Anybody familiar with the story of Leroy Jenkins? Anybody know Leroy Jenkins? It's a great YouTube video with some language, so be careful. But basically, it's a, it's a recording of, of a bunch of guys playing World of Warcraft. I've never played World of Warcraft, but I think I know how this works. And they're all about to go into this room. They're about to do this raid together, and they're, they're, they're working out their plan. They're like, you cast this spell, you do this thing, you hit them with this sword, and all they're going over and over again. And they're going on. I mean, this is a long por- sort of portion. And then all of a sudden, one of the guys over his headset says, time's up, Leroy Jenkins. And then he runs off. And they're all the little guys on their little headsets are like, did, did Leroy just run in there? And then they run in there and they start screaming, stick to the plan, stick to the plan, stick to the plan. They just get slaughtered. And then they yell at Leroy and, and it's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> Again, it's not real, it's a video game. So we're all fine here. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to maybe feel good about today, church is good, family thing went good today, and you're going to look in the mirror, and you're going to be like, I'm ready to tackle today, and you're going to be like, Leroy Jenkins, or whatever your name is. (laughs) Whatever your name, Travis Cook, right? It doesn't work as well. Leroy Jenkins really works. (laughs) You need to have a plan, and you need to stick with it. So I want to give you five stones, five stones of faith that you can use tomorrow morning when you get up. First, your profession of faith. Remember who we are. Remember who you are. In Christ, if you've trusted in Christ, if you believe in him, if you've put your hope for salvation in a relationship with God in the cross of Christ, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, then that is your profession. That is what you believe. And it becomes the truest thing about you. And it becomes this thing. It becomes who you are. Again and again, it just becomes richer and deeper. 
And when you run into that first difficult thing in life tomorrow, whatever it is that you challenge, remember who you are. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's got me. No matter what happens, I'm trusting in him. He's got me. He's got me. I'm adopted by God. He's my father. I'm going to trust him. If you don't have that stone in your bag, then the other stones don't work. You have to have that stone. And we would love to talk to you about how you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You can do that in the next steps room. We'll talk about that in a bit. Second stone, the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.26 is real specific about what the Holy Spirit does. One of the things that he does He groans on our behalf. The Holy Spirit does great things, amazing things. He comes and lives inside of us when we believe. He counsels us, he comforts us, and encourages us. But he also groans on our behalf. He intercedes for us. So if you ever wanted to pray, but you've just been so worked up that you didn't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit functions on your behalf, translating for you. Like what he means is this. When he's screaming out, God help me, or when when she's yelling, oh my gosh, I can't take another day, the Holy Spirit groans on your behalf. He speaks for you so that you know it's privileged communication, it's protected communication. Third stone. I also saw Avengers last night, and so the stones now mean something differently to me. I'm just sitting here like, wow, I really could have done something with that. By the way, no, I'm just kidding. No spoilers. The Word of God, third stone, the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. You're weak, you're going to be full of highs and lows. Your month, highs and lows. Your emotions will change. Your feelings will change. You'll feel close to God one day and absolutely distant from him the next. And there'll be seemingly no rhyme or reason between the two. You'll be like, I didn't commit some great sin. If I had, maybe I could understand feeling that way. Your emotions, your circumstances, your feelings will change. Do you know what does not change? The word of God. Do you know why the word of God does not change? Because the person who wrote it does not change. And so... We need to be in the Word of God. Saturate your life with the Word of God. Read it. Study it. Stick it places in your home. The places where you struggle with temptation, put a Bible verse there. Read it out loud in your home. Use it. Some of you walked with us through Year of the Bible and you took the exit ramp at Deuteronomy and you haven't come back yet. (laughs) I understand. I sympathize. We're in Isaiah right now. We're in the back half of Isaiah, which is all about the future kingdom and what God's going to do to restore and redeem his people. Isaiah 55, by the way, is something that I've read recently. If you haven't read it, um, you know what? Actually, I wasn't planning on reading it. I'm going to read it. Why not? Here we are. Isaiah 55. We got time. 55.10. I don't know if I can get through it. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, And do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. And it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. And instead of the briar shall come the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Amen. I derive great hope and joy in that passage. Because it won't be cut off. And we need the word of God in our lives to remind us of that. You have a new mission. Here at Park Cities, we talk about rescuing one another from cultural Christianity. To follow Jesus every day. Every day. That's how we make disciples here. If you go to another church, they're going to make disciples somewhere else, some, somehow else. They're going to word it differently. Same mission for everybody, but we just kind of focus it in a certain way. It's kind of unique to our context. We all have things about our life that are culturally Christian, things that we do, ways that we still believe that we're enslaved, right? We just kind of fall back on it again and again and again. We have a new mission to proclaim the good news to the captives and let them know that through Christ they are set free. Make it known to your coworkers. Make it known to your friends. Make it known to your family. That parent that you love, talk with them. If you don't know their salvation, talk to them. We have a new mission. It's a new stone, something that drives us. And then the last one, the last stone, the body of Christ. Look, David went into that valley by himself. Jesus goes into the valley of the shadow of death by himself. 
And Jesus goes into that valley by himself. He's crucified on a hill by himself so we don't have to be by ourselves. You don't fight alone. You fight with the people of God. And every single one of us is carrying some wound, something that just is killing us. Maybe it's something that was done to you, some abuse, some cruelty, and you're hurting. Maybe you're dying, like literally dying, and you have months or weeks to live. Maybe there's a struggle in your life. Your marriage is in trouble. You're lonely, whatever it is. Guess what? There is the body of Christ, and we will fight with you. We will fight with you because we love you, and God has given us each other. And when we are together, he is with us. And the Holy Spirit is with us. And we can have a fighting faith. I can't have a fighting faith on my own. I'm just like you. I'm going to go in tomorrow morning and be like, oh my gosh, what the heck. But I'm going to remember my brothers. I'm going to remember my sisters. I'm going to remember my Lord. And maybe the Lord will give me with grace to have a fighting faith. Let us fight with you. Join a connect group. Join a small group. Find someone to talk to, and let's fight together, back to back. For the riches are great, and the name of God is greater, and there's people that need help. Let's take our five stones. Let's go to war. Let's pray. Father God, you are good to us because you have gifted us with tools to have a fighting faith. But more than that, Lord, the victory's already been won. It is sealed and secure in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We believe in you and we trust you. Whatever it is that we face today, Lord God, I pray for each person, whatever it is that they're holding on to so tightly and they're so afraid to turn it over, Lord God, because of feeling judged or feeling overlooked or whatever it might be, God, I pray that they would turn it loose and give it to you. Pray that they would, you would use it, Lord, to make your name great and to bless those that share it. We love you, Lord Jesus. We trust you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.